I joke about saying your choice of advisor is as important almost as a marriage decision because it's a life decision. I hope this video helps more marriage to be happier. Welcome back to PhD Coffee Time. This is the online community for you as PhD student to get motivation, peer support, and practical tips during your PhD. Today, I like to talk about how you should be looking for suitable environment before you even accept a PhD program. This video was based on a three hour Zoom call on this topic. PhD is not the default of your next career stage unless you want to be a professor or you are really committed in investing at least five years, four years of your life. A PhD is made for people who want training to be a professor. On the other hand, you could invest the time to get different jobs. You'll be able to gain different workplace exposure there's no right or wrong answer and everyone has a different financial situation, different personal passion and different problem they want to solve in lives. I recommend taking a look at your master's or bachelor's program, gather information from many sources in the alumni network. Before we start the conversation about picking the right advisor, it's quite shocking to realize that I was on the rare end of this argument about whether or not PhD is considered a job. There was a popular post on Twitter about whether or not PhD students consider their work as real work. In the literal working sense, I have no doubt this is hard work and it's real work. But let's take a technical distinguishment of what you are signing up to when you are starting a PhD. First, the question is, is PhD actually a job? Yes, you get an income. In some countries, you even have employees benefits. You seem to be working with a boss, which is your advisor. A lot of time, people have to overwork for long hours. so. The thickness of the work feels very much like a real job. And one could get fired if you fail. And in some country, PhD allowance is actually taxable. So a lot of people would consider PhD is like a job option. A decision to start a PhD should never be simply based on wanting a job. So here's why. Mostly, your income of PhD is only an allowance for you to do scholarly activity. It is not taxable. It's the mean of you to support a living while you are doing basic science research. And in a lot of countries, PhD do not qualify as the human resource definition of a job. No retirement benefits, no overtime payment. And yes, you work a lot, you have bosses and you could get fired, but so as any education you try to pursue. If you go to medical school and you don't work hard enough, you will also get kicked out of the program. So it's technically your willing investment as an education that you want to put by the end on your CV. You don't get any jobs that is on the market that give you a line on education. You also get mentoring, training, and academic freedom for the benefits of being a PhD student. And with that said, I hope you will be seeking an eye out on PhD opportunities, focusing on the fact that it is a safe space for you to grow and fail as a researcher. In the journey, it should provide you the training, the academic freedom, the mentoring, and the professional development for you to end up to become an independent researcher. You should start a PhD if you want an academic career. If you understand this is a huge time and energy investment, and maybe you want a job that requires PhD qualification. Some people working as a technician in a pharmaceutical company might be interested to get a PhD so that they could become medical science liaison or get promoted to be R&D scientist. These are the valid considerations before you apply to PhD. If you try to measure your input of energy to your payment and salary, 
that is how a lot of people get really miserable along the way of the PhD research. And I assure you there's always better jobs out there that you can land on and you will have a much more rewarding investment of your time and energy for four to five years. But if you are still here and you are considering to do PhD, I hope this convince you to think of PhD as an investment for a better future that is aligning to what you want to do. Every time I see this figure, it causes a little bit of anxiety because I think you might unsubscribe right away. But I think there is an importance to clear up the chances and the risk that people are taking while they are starting a PhD. You will see the line in blue actually reflects all the number of PhD getting graduated in the system. But on the other hand, the orange line is actually the number of new faculty positions opening up. So if someone wanting to do a PhD, it's obvious that we are seeing a high competitive job market. I hope this figure, when shown to the right student, you won't be discouraged by it, but you intentionally starting to think about what you could do to outcompete the job market. Part of what you could do is to prepare yourself to choose the best environment that will make you more competitive by the time you graduate a PhD. There's an interesting study published last month about PhD success rate in terms of citation number and publication. This study is quite encouraging because that means PhD student could look for the environment that favor the success of the PhD program. From this study, the best thing you could do as a PhD student is to apply for a scholarship, get awarded before you start a PhD, find an advisor that is research driven and work at a research driven institution. And on this table, the first column is reporting the mean value of numbers of publication in each of these cases. You can see with scholarship, a student could achieve 4.2 papers by the end of a PhD. Without a scholarship, on average, most PhD only get 1.6 papers. First of all, before you start a PhD project, you first need the approval of that PI, the principal investigator. That person will say, do I have the resources and time to take care of four years of work? And remember a PhD project, you're researching a topic, a research area that hasn't been explored by humankind. This is a high risk project and you're putting yourself in that situation. And that's why it's critical you work with someone that you trust by interviewing your advisor. A lot of people don't realize you are also interviewing if you will be a good cultural fit to that environment, to that institution and to that lab. Because you have to realize that your advisor has power over everything. Your graduation, your progress is decided by this very person. I joke about saying your choice of advisor is as important almost as a marriage decision because it's a life decision. Not only they are doing the right research that you wanted to pursue, you also need to have a personality match. You are working as hard as he like or she like, make a decision for your future four to five years. So my first advice, uh, technical advice, is you need to explore how productive you want to be in your PhD. Go to the Google Scholar page of your advisor and take a careful look to research that. First of all, is that person productive? Second of all, are those productivity aligning to what you are proposing to work on? The good way is to look at the last student of that advisor and to understand there is a certain number, you can take a mean value, then you will know maybe every year you are supposed to publish a paper and versus some lab has student has no publication. And if you want to be a professor, if you want to be competitive in postdoc scholarship, you might be in trouble because your published paper is a currency.
But say for example, if your advisor is really productive in some tiny research area, but suddenly that person has a new grant and you are the very first person to do that project, then you are taking more risk. I'm not saying you shouldn't take the risk, but you have to measure how much resources are you going to be given? Is that like a full three year grant versus six months grant? It's going to affect how much risk you are going to take if you have a lot of resources and you can pay for the help and services like a central facility, technicians, hours. So if there is a high risk project, it's okay because research is based on innovation and every innovation based on risk. But you need to ask that very important question on how much resources are you being supported working with some central TEM facility. Every hour counts in those cases and every hour is money. So you need to figure that out in advance. The second consideration you might need to think about before you accept a PhD is whether or not you are willing to work with that institution. Sometimes it could be a massive lab in a tiny university, like a big fish in a small pond situation that could be desirable, maybe more likely to get internal institutional award. But on the flip side, you might have a much weaker alumni network comparing to like Harvard grad, Yale grad. Another advantage of working with a big institution is that you're going to have support for alternative career choices. One good way to look at this is to Google career center for PhD within that institution. A nice decent sized university should have a PhD advising career center so halfway through your PhD, you will be able to get some feedback on how to write your resume, CV, and network to your alumni that makes all the difference when you are applying for funding, fellowship, or jobs. And I would argue that if you are recognizable in a tiny institution, you might have as much resources as someone in a big institution who never collaborate internationally, cross-institutionally, so it really depends on how you are networking while you're doing PhD. The third consideration would be to ask, how is it like to work in that lab? One way that you could find out is to ask a referee, meaning the last person who graduated from that lab. What does that alumni look like? And could you get a hold of that person? Or is that person willing to talk about the experience in that lab at all? Bear in mind, if you talk to a current student, a lot of time student who hasn't graduated, they don't want to get into trouble. So the most honest answer lies in the alumni. And it is your job before you start PhD research is to research, ask that very alumni who just recently graduated in that lab. Sometimes what doesn't work for one student may not be too bad for you. Having that conversation, it gives you a clue on how that lab culture is. This video just sums up, it's really about the consent. I hope this video helps more marriage to be happier. And if you find the right professor who is as workaholic as you are, then congratulations. Or if you find the professor who has the same microscope love that you have. But the key point of this video, I'm trying to make sure you have your consent before you inject yourself with that high risk poison that could kill you. You can see I'm studying clinical research these days. It's really fun and I'm looking for a job. Hire me, please. I hope this is helpful and it gives you some perspective that maybe you haven't considered uh, as a PhD student. I believe that if you spell out all of your requirements in the very beginning, it's only going to make your PhD and advisor relationship a lot stronger. You need to be totally honest about what you are curious about, have a personal human connection with that person because you're going to trust and rely and have that person advocate for you for the rest of your life basically before you land on the professor job. So you want to pick the right one, don't hide anything. If you have children and you need to take care of them, 
tell them that. And the person who doesn't concern about your personal well-being, chances are you shouldn't be working for that person anyways. So with that, I hope you learned something from this video and comment below if I miss anything important or if I say something that upset you. I'm sorry, you have the right to leave a dislike if you think I offended you. Thank you for watching and I will see you the next time. I hope you have a wonderful week.